Thank you. I'm worn out just watching that group sing. <laughs> I did get the message, though. We can take the land. Very, very good. I'm watching the crowd out here. I don't know where they come from, but they got the rhythm. Unless you know how to weave or you get knocked off your chair out there. So really a blessing to be here. Uh, that group has as much ener energy as Daniel Anderson. <laughs> I still remember this, the uh, sermon that Daniel preached, the third generation sells the farm. Preached here, right? Yeah. Still remember that. Well, it's a great blessing to be here. I, uh, in spite of airlines, why I made it. And uh, you're going to have a great conference. Turn with me to the book of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to minister, see uh, many of the pastors that I've uh, become acquainted with. And so good to see you here. Uh, blessing of God is in this conference. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Mark Hatfield, who was a senator in the United States, tells of touring uh, Calcutta, India, with Mother Teresa. And he was visiting the so-called House of Dying, where sick and, uh, and uh, dying children are cared for in their last days in the dispensary, where the poor lined up by the hundreds to receive medical attention. Watching Mother Teresa uh, minister to these people, uh, feeding and nursing those left by others to die, Hatfield was overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the suffering she and her co-workers faced daily. How can you bear the load without being crushed by it, he asked. Mother Teresa replied, my dear Senator, I'm not called to be successful, I'm called to be faithful. Great statement. And I want to preach to you one verse, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, on a great virtue. Listen to these words. And the things that you've learned from me among many witnesses, the same commit the, the, thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So I want to preach to you this evening about a great virtue, and that great virtue is faithfulness. And think with me for a moment as we ponder that because uh, actually uh, you and I who are believers, but especially those who have responded to ministry, we are uh, uh, focused on making our mark. In other words, most human beings uh, who have any kind of uh, ambition to do a work for God. They're focused on making their mark. That means that they want to make their wife, their life uh, mean something. And it's interesting that uh, Jeremiah had a friend, Baruch, and uh, he gave him a word from God. This is found in Jeremiah 45 and verse five. And seekest thou great things for thyself, seek them not. For behold, I bring evil upon all flesh, says the Lord, but your life, uh, Will I give you for, an, uh, for a prize uh, in all the places uh, which you go? That word was given to Baruch in a time of chaos. Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had come in. He's taking the, uh, the loot out of the temple, the, all the temple treasury. He's taking all the people who have any kind of talent, taking them in. He's taking the young people training them, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's taking them. And so in this time, Baruch is wondering about his future. And that word comes from God through Jeremiah. And note something for us, because most of us who are in this building, who are in any kind of ministry, we're focused upon, we want to make our life count. Can you say amen? That's what we want to do. So as we do that, we need to ponder uh, something very important uh, because many times we hesitate uh, when we're faced with the opportunities because first of all, we begin to think about uh, self-interest. 
that moves on mis many people who are going to do something for God. It was Peter uh, who, when Jesus is talking about the various uh, uh, sacrifices that need to be made, he says these words, uh, and this applies to many who are here tonight. What do we get out of this? Think about that for a moment because many of you are here, uh, you're pondering your ministry, you're pondering your future, and uh, these words can apply to you because here's a crucial issue in verse 2 uses one word, and that word is faithful men, and faithfulness then uh, is going to be the theme of anyone who does a work for God, and we need to ponder that because the word faith actually is the Greek word pistis. It means uh, uh, praiseworthy. So let's ponder for a moment as we consider this because Jesus emphasizes this. He tells two parables. One parable is the parable of the pounds. The other is the parable of the talents. These are uh, uh, measures of economic worth. Uh, and as he tells both of those parables, uh, it brings to the forefront a very important fact uh, in both of those parables. Uh, and the issue is not quantity, but the issue is faithfulness. You read those and digest for yourself. Uh, because the lesson that we need to learn as believers uh, is not the quantity of the work and production that we can do, but are we faithful to that which God puts in our hands? Uh, and every worker needs to learn that and practice that uh, because that's going to be the major focus uh, of your ministry. In the uh, book of Proverbs, uh, there's an image and it brings this to the forefront because this has become very rare in the Christian experience, especially today. In Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 6 says, uh, All most men will proclaim every man his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Now underline that in your Bible because that's going to be the issue of the hour. And unless we learn that, a Catholic laboring in Calcutta is going to show us up who are saved, full of the Holy Ghost, uh, and anointed by God. This is crucial to learn this issue in life. In the book of Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 19 says, Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. So you're going to have a painful experience in life uh, if you put tr trust in men who are unfaithful to God. That's what discipleship is all about. Can you say amen? We are discipling fellowship. That means that we're working with believers, and as we're working with believers, uh, we're in the discipleship ministry beginning to measure people in actual experiences in life. Uh, and as we're measuring them, we're looking for faithful disciples uh, that we can invest our time, uh, our resources, uh, and our own reputations in sending them out to plant churches because faithfulness uh, is the issue of the hour. We're in a great Bible conference tonight. And if you get nothing else out of this conference, note down what we're talking about tonight is a great vir virtue. And Paul says to Timothy, Timothy's the pastor of the church in Ephesus, and he's bringing him to an understanding. And he said, the things that you've heard and the things that you've seen in me, you take these and commit these to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So here we have a tremendous principle, and that principle is we're responsible to create a culture of discipleship in our ministries. Unless we are able to create a, a culture of discipleship, we're just religious, saying religious songs, using religious phrases, we're missing the issue because character tonight uh, is the issue that we need to learn. I well remember uh, in American uh, politics, before Bill Clinton was running for office, uh, uh, he had a very bad reputation for morals. And people were warning, said, as they were warning, they were, used this phrase, uh, that a man who is unfaithful to his wife is not just unfaithful to his wife, he's unfaithful, period. Bill Clinton was elected, that was ignored, and we found out very soon thereafter 
that his same faithless character that he took into the office, he kept in the office, uh, brought great damage to America and the office, uh, and uh, people knowing that he was uh, a man without character elected him to the office, uh, and we paid that price. He left behind his wife. Thank God, God didn't let her get in office. Can you say amen? <laughs> I mean, it, I don't know if you realize what a great deliverance America's had had. As I told my con my uh, congregation, as the election was coming up, pray, pray, pray. If uh, Donald Trump gets elected, it'll be a miracle of God. And so uh, if you quit listening to BBC, you'll understand what's happening in America today. We have a president who has uh, all the DNA of a man. <laughs> Why are you frowning at me? <laughs> ladies are wonderful. Can you say amen? We appreciate the ladies. Uh, and they have great talents, but God put the responsibility for running planet Earth in the hands of men. And Donald Trump is a man. So if you quit listening to BBC and CNN, which we have a nickname, Clinton News Network, why, then you'll begin to understand it's all going to come out okay. But faithfulness uh, is the issue of the hour, and we want to fasten on this tonight as we're in this Bible conference and build a virtue, personally, uh, of faithfulness. So let's ponder this for a moment because the Apostle Paul uh, underlined this. Uh, it's the issue of discipleship, uh, and he focuses on this and he gives an image, uh, often in the scripture, of a runner in a race. And as he draws that issue, he makes us understand not the start, but the finish is the issue. Many people start, can you say amen? Even in uh, our own experience, we've seen many people who've started, they've done well at the start, but the problem is they didn't finish. Uh, and the issue that the Apostle Paul focused on is finishing. Second Timothy 4 verse 7, he said about his own ministry, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now lock these things into your mind for a moment uh, because uh, these things have to be established in our character. And as they're established in our character, they're established by the insignificant things uh, in life. We make a mistake that, uh, that uh, here we are in the process of life and suddenly we're going to hear a trump. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, Mitchell is coming down. And so here's our time to perform. But I want to tell you that it begins a long time before the trumpet sounds. And it begins in the little insignificant things of life. That's where faithfulness uh, is established. Uh, and when you're in a disciple ministry, then that's how we discover the people uh, that we need. Uh, because the mistake is not the big event. Jesus said, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in that which is much. So if you're a disciple maker, which we trust that you are, then you have to pay attention to the little things. Uh, Luke 16, 10, Jesus says that, uh, is that the man who is faithful in that which is least uh, will be faithful also in that which is must. And so if you're wanting someday to make your mark, you're going to have to start now in the little things of life. And it's important that you understand that uh, because it's not just uh, the attending church that's important, but it's functioning. Now listen carefully to me. I was triggered on this. I was in England, and uh, the pastors were just, uh, were one of the pastors was, was saying, you know, uh, how do you get a church that's stagnant moving again? I said, well, it's your responsibility as a pastor. Number one, you... Uh, Start moving yourself. That really helps. Can you say amen? <laughs> but this brought to the forefront, there are many, many people, and some of you are here tonight, that you attend church, and that's good. Thank God for that. You need to attend church. Yeah? But you need to function as a believer, and something happens to us as human beings in the process of life uh, is that uh, we grow stagnant. 
people who grow older, they get families, they get responsibilities, and that's, uh, they should take care of those and pay attention to that. But if we had every uh, believer in Jesus Christ functioning as a believer, it would very soon revolutionize the world, not just your church, but the world be revolutionized. Matthew 25 and verse 23, his Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter you into the joy of the Lord. So think about that for a moment because what we need in life is every believer functioning as a believer. What happens to people is that in the process of time, they, uh, they, they just settle in their attending church uh, and their Christianity just means uh, that they're attending church. Someone made a tremendous statement I read some years ago that stuck with me and said, uh, churches are filled with good people doing nothing. Now think about that and measure your own life. Well, I go to church, that's wonderful. We need you in church. But Christianity is more than just going to church. Christianity is a lifestyle that you're faithful to God and it begins in the, uh, in the small things of life uh, and it forms that character because you need to be profitable to God. Can you say amen? And be encouraged tonight because uh, we have in the scripture the example. There was a man whose name was Onesimus. He was uh, unfaithful. He stole money from his master, uh, Philemon. He ran away to Rome, but when he's in Rome, he came in contact with a faithful man that wrote Proverbs 2.2, whose name is Paul, who won him to Christ. And as he won him to Christ, he became a profitable believer. And the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to Philemon, put it in Omnesimus' hand, sent him back to his master. And that's where the book of Philemon comes from. And sent him back to his master and said to him, I know that he stole this money, but you put that to my account. I'm gonna, I'll repay you that but he is profitable to me for the ministry. I want you to send him back to me. So it's, it's possible for you to not be profitable now, but to be profitable. It was John Mark, who was a part of an evangelistic crusade with Paul, and in the middle of that, uh, when he was probably in Asia, he departed, went on back, uh, and, uh, and uh, betrayed the responsibility that he had, uh, but Paul later says to John Mark, uh, he's profitable to me for the ministry. So you can be a believer and not be profitable to God. So what I'm challenging you for tonight is the stewardship of life uh, because every believer has a responsibility to function. That means you are a witness. That means that you are taking responsibility for various uh, ministries in your church. And in 1 Peter 4, verses 9 and 10 says, Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I preached a sermon recently on hospitality. Uh, how many of you have read Still Taking the Land? Have you ever read that book? Let me see. Let me see your hand. I'm not going to give an altar call. I'm just asking you. <laughs> in, that, uh, in that book, Still Taking the Land, and uh, uh, we, uh, we uh, named that after you've left is what we really meant, Still Taking the Land, after you've left. And so uh, in that book, there's a sermon that I preached on hospitality. I was triggered by that because I pastored one time in Vancouver Island, Canada. And this is the most amazing church that I've ever seen because uh, every visitor that visited that church did not leave that service uh, without an invitation of somebody in that church, a family in that church or an individual that would uh, invite them home in the morning ser ser service for a lunch. They had an invitation to come and uh, share lunch with them. 
In the evening, after the service, they invited him home for a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, and a, and a uh, biscuit and, uh, and uh, salmon. And, uh, and, and that's where that word hospitality comes from. It's used five times in the Bible, uh, one time for leadership. So think about that now. You say, well, I can't preach. Uh, well, I can't play music. But you could be hospitable to someone who visits the church and make a great impact. Uh, and uh, the, uh, one, one of the uh, uh, writers uh, noted again that the churches are filled with people, good people, doing nothing. Now lock your mind into what I'm saying because God intends the church of Jesus Christ to be a functioning body of believers uh, because God gives capabilities to your body. Can you say amen? Gives you hands, gives you feet, gives you a mouth, uh, uh, gives you the ability to act. Uh, and that's true concerning the body of Jesus Christ uh, who are a group of believers. Uh, and each of us can do something uh, in life. Think about this because here's the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy uh, to propagate his example. And as he propagates his example, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 15 says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions uh, which you've been taught, whether by word uh, or by our epistle. So we have the history in the New Testament. Luke chapter 8 verse 3, And Joanna, the wife of Chosus, uh, Herod steward and Susanna and many others who ministered unto Jesus uh, of their substance. Now ponder this uh, because here's a practical application uh, because believers uh, can function to souls. Most people who visit a church, uh, they're looking for uh, uh, friendship. Can you say amen? They want to be accepted by their fellow human beings. They want to be made important. And one thing that we have been able to cultivate in the Prescott Church that makes us a faithful congregation is that every visitor that comes in, someone needs to make contact with them, ask who they are, uh, tell them how much they appreciate them. And uh, I, one of the things that's uh, crucial is they're needy people. Uh, multitudes of needy people. Many of these visited church looking for someone that's interested in them. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 35 and 36 says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. So think about those words now, because Jesus uses those words uh, to speak to the disciples, uh, to make them understand uh, that every believer can be covered in those words there, can minister to human beings uh, and bring to them some kind of uh, help uh, and ministry that will touch their needs. So let's ponder this for a moment because uh, uh, our responsibility as pastors is to create a culture of discipleship. And uh, this is contagious. As you begin to start that, that's why Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2, 2, ponder about what he said. He said, you commit these to faithful men who, what? Shall be able to impart that to others also. And so a discipleship ministry must be created by the pastor. It's your responsibility to find uh, 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 areas, uh, set the example, preach enough to make your people feel guilty if they're not doing anything, but just coming to church. Wonderful to come to church. Can you say amen? But Christianity is a functioning body of believers meeting the need of humanity, and we either become an example for good or we become an example for bad. And the reason this pastor asked me was his congregation was stagnant uh, and this was bothering him. Thank God for that. There are people sitting here this evening, you're stagnant. Say, so you're accusing me. Yes, I am looking you straight in the eye. <laughs> That's what I, my job in preaching is to make you mad or make you glad. 
And I guarantee you before this service is over, one of those will have taken place. Uh, <laughs> and so we become like the people that we associate with. So let's ponder this for a moment because uh, the question was asked that triggered me uh, on the sermon that I'm preaching tonight because I realized uh, that this is the major difficulty in Christianity today. Our churches are filled with good people doing nothing. But that's not necessarily uh, needs to be because the pastor sets the example. The pastor finds the places of exampleship for outreach and evangelism. The pastor can turn the congregation around. Uh, when I went to Perth in 2009, uh, many of you don't know that, but that congregation was a congregation uh, that they called the Platinum Congregation. Only certain people could function. And if, unless you were part of the Platinum Club, you could do nothing, whatever. And it was very difficult to get into that. Uh, and 175 people exited with the other rebel that went down the street five minutes, started, uh, started another ministry, already had a building rented before he, before he announced uh, that was going to come to pass. Uh, and uh, that uh, nobody could break into that. But within a week after I took that congregation, I had people coming to me. One man come and said, Pastor Mitchell, we don't have, a, we don't have any drama team anymore. Could I start one? I said, absolutely, do it. Had another one come and said, Pastor, we don't have any Sunday school. Can I start the Sunday school? I said, absolutely, get it done. I had people coming to me over and over again. Can I do a healing crusade out in the, uh, out in the uh, park? I said, absolutely, tell me what you need. And within, uh, within uh, weeks, uh, 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 John Martin had announced a crusade in a little park down from that in, uh, uh, in Perth. And I went to that outreach. 75 of the Perth congregation was in that outreach. I said, thank God. I went downtown to the first uh, outreach in uh, uh, Hay Street Mall. And uh, all four of our council members were down there on that outreach. I said, thank God. These are people that can be motivated. Can you say amen? And, uh, and uh, uh, when I left that, I had the joy of seeing a congregation uh, uh, was functioning. Tom Paine has never stopped that. He just accelerated it and uh, enlarged it. Romans chapter 12, verse 6. Listen to this very carefully. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, where the prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teaches uh, on teaching. Or he that exhorts uh, on exhortation. He that gives, let him do it with liberality. He that ruleth with diligence. He that shows mercy with cheerfulness. And so here we have the outline that is given to us. Something that you can do. And the Apostle Paul says, teach others also. So let's function now on the issue, the, the issue here. Because vision actually... Uh, is a cause and it is a challenge. Think about that for a moment because the challenge is to older saints. Listen to these words, Psalms 92, verse 12 through 14. Can I say something to the pastors who are here? Some of the most valuable people in your congregation are the older saints. Mark that down. Don't leave it to the young people because half the time their brain's disconnected anyway. <laughs> It's the older people who know why, not just what. Listen to Psalms 92 and embrace this as your own. Verse 12, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Note that word fat, it's not talking about weight. <laughs> it's talking about spiritual health. So let's ponder this for a moment as we come to grips with this. Uh, Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So it is valuable and it's valid for you to attend church. Uh, but don't stop there. Psalms 92 
is both a challenge and it is a pattern. You shall be fat and flourishing. You shall be healthy in your spirit and in your soul, and you shall still be bringing forth fruit in old age. You have to recognize the value of older believers. In Acts 21 and verse 16, listen to this. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea, and they brought with them one Mnason of Cyprus, an elderly disciple with whom we should lodge. Now, note that because it says specifically uh, that Mnason is an older disciple. In other words, he has gone the course. Uh, he's now in his senior citizen years, uh, and he still is mentioned uh, as a valuable asset uh, to that congregation that is there. Uh, and Paul makes note of that. Uh, older people... Uh, can still be disciples. Can you say amen? amen? So every person should seek God for some kind of ministry or some kind of service opportunity, not just leave it to the young people uh, because there's something you can do. We have a rehab ministry that's been started. I mentioned it last night. At, uh, uh, half of America's on, uh, on um, pills. And uh, you say, uh, they're drug addicts. They're made drug addicts by the doctor that did an operation, give them oxycodone or oxycontin, and they never got off it. They're still on it. So we have a rehab ministry. It's very fruitful, it's wonderful, wonderful ministry. And uh, when I went to lunch, I, I usually go to lunch uh, up in what's called the Glutton's Paradise. It's a, it's a, uh, you don't go there to uh, eat. You go there to get your money's worth. And so. <laughs> You can look at the congregation, uh, I mean the group that's gathered there, and uh, obviously some of them are getting their money's worth. So uh, I usually go up for lunch up there, and it's quite frequently I go up there, and, I, and some of our older congregation, I see them, uh, and they have one of these uh, rehab guys uh, that are in our church, they're taking the lunch. Obviously, the rehabbers are not paying a bill because they're still rehabbing. And one of our older congregation has taken responsibility and established a relationship with these young people who many of them are 19, 20, 21, 22 years old. Some of them fresh out of prison. They've done prison time, came into contact during our rehab ministry. And uh, the uh, valuable contact with these older people, and I've seen this quite frequently, different couples, they're taking these young people and taking them out to dinner and establishing a relationship. One of our older saints when I came to Prescott was a name, Marcella Burgess. She was 75 years old. They told me she's in the hospital and I went up and visited her. And uh, I told my wife, I said, uh, she's not gonna live. She'll, she'll, uh, she's on her last legs. But she lived to 95, 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> A wonderful uh, old saint, and she was a wonderful cook. She had a Hispanic background, and she could cook. Uh, when we did potlucks, we all looked to see what Marcella Burgess had cooked. <laughs> she took in Harold Warner. Harold Warner was a young hippie uh, that uh, he, he was a total loss to society. When he was <laughs> When he was baptized, he wanted to be baptized naked. He said, no, 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 you don't, you don't do that. So Marcella Burgess took Kara Warner into her home. She became a reference point for him. And she said, uh, you can come in. I'll give you room and board. She charged him money uh, for that. But she said, you're going to be in bed at 10 o'clock at night. Now, can you imagine? He's 21 or 22 years old. You know how the energy flows in 21 and 22 year old. And uh, if you're going to be here in my house, you're going to be in bed at 10 o'clock at night. And he did. She furnished a stabilizing influence from him and became a wonderful pastor. And many of our saints uh, that furnished a reference point for these young people that are now scattered all over the world as missionaries uh, and, uh, and successful church planters uh, were fed a solid reference point uh, by the older saints in our congregation that, that came in 
begin to take that responsibility. Uh, and so think about Mother Teresa. She said to Mark Hatfield, uh, yes, it is a crushing burden, it is a, but God didn't call me to be successful, he called me to be faithful. Now if Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa a Catholic can say that, how much more should us who are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost be able to lock on to that virtue which is the virtue of faithfulness. Think about that for a moment. Manasin, an old disciple. What that means is he had been faithful and in this ministry furnishing something for the uh, ministry of the Apostle Paul, he was brought into the equation to help transport into house uh, and to make that meaningful. There's a famous figure in uh, church history, his name is William Booth. William Booth uh, was a resident of London, England. And at that period of time, young people, children could buy whiskey in the pubs of, of England. And it was an absolute chaos, a debauchery, the exploitation of these uh, children that were drunk, the drunkenness, uh, the streets were filled with it. And William Booth, uh, one night his wife was at a meeting and he took a walk through the streets of London. He sees all of this and when he comes back home, his wife came home uh, and he said to her, dear, I have found our calling. And he established what is known as the Salvation Army. It spread across the world and you'll find the remnants of that. Sadly, they've left that ministry of soul winning and turned into a welfare program. But it began as a wonderful soul winning organization. And when William Booth died, they paraded to honor him in the streets of London because of the tremendous impact. Uh, so here he is, now think for a moment. Uh, he's religious, he's uh, a believer, but he's not doing anything that is meaningful, but when he saw that need, he responded, returned to his home, uh, and told his wife, dear, I found our calling, and responded to that need and made impact for God. I want every head bowed, I want every eye closed. Think about this tonight. While your heads are bowed,